I, um, I stopped yesterday um, after describing detachment limited and transport limited uh, riverbed evolution. So, um, what I wanted to, uh, to come to is to these last two points here. And it's uh, quite small, but I hope you can see them and you have the PDF. This point number two here of my, um, of what I want to tell you uh, about this is that drainage area increases downstream. So that's why I put this R, R, R and L, L, L. Drainage area increases downstream according to Hack's law. We have seen that together. Hack's law states that length of the basin, so in a way that's your distance along X as you travel from up to towards the, the from the source to the to the outlet is proportional to the coefficient B times drainage area above the, the point you're looking at, exponent C. Okay, so that's hacks coefficient and hacks exponent. And we have seen a very general rule from uh, the big compilation by uh, Dave Montgomery and Bill Dietrich that length equals 1.7, almost square root of three, times a exponent 0.5. So it's the square root of drainage area. So that's important because um, at any point in a river, um, if you know one of those two parameters, you can know the other. For instance, if you know that from the source to where you stand, you have a hundred kilometers, you can uh, simply derive the drainage area that corresponds to a hundred kilometer here. Okay, you have one equation, one unknown. Now, uh, just one question. Yes. Uh, what is the, the number? 1.7? 1.7. Ah, okay. Thank you. So, so you, you, you can do the, the exercise. Uh, Oh, the screen is still on a high resolution. This is going to result in a big uh, problem for the video. Just wait a second, please. Uh, the recording. So, um, so how much do you do you get? Did you? J'ai trouvé, mais je suis pas du tout sûr. 3460 mètres carrés. Que Alors, pas des mètres carrés, probablement des kilomètres carrés, puisque la rivière ah. fait 100 km. Ah, juste... ok, c'était 100 km. Ok, ok. Ouais. Bah, ouais, du coup, euh, mais je suis pas sûr. Hein. 3460. I got the same. Ok. Km2. Okay, so so it's quite um, it's quite useful. And the same if you have uh, an area of yeah three thousand uh, kilometers square, then you know exactly what's your what's your drainage area, what's your river length. It's it's a big um, you know it's a scaling law, and it has a very big margin of uncertainty. It's just a number. It should be like this if this river is similar to most rivers of the world. But in fact, it could be, it could be 10 times less or 10 times more. Okay, so it's just if you want the typical river, it's going to be like this. But it can be at the extreme 10 times more or 10 times less. So it's just an order of magnitude. Um, sorry. Okay, now 
you remember we spoke about steady state. So I'm on point uh, number three here. We spoke about steady state and steady state implies that uplift equals erosion. So dz over dt, which is equal to u uplift minus erosion. You remember the, the diagram, uplift minus erosion equals dz over dt. At steady state, dz over dt equals zero because u and e uplift and erosion are equal. Okay, so here the little diagram I have is a river longitudinal profile from source to outlet, something here. If my landscape is at steady state, I have uplift, you know, this, the, the rocks come up because of tectonic processes and erosion in the river brings them, brings them down, erodes, erode them. So the river is eroding and everywhere along the river, U uplift and erosion, let's say, if, if, if uplift is everywhere the same, let's say I have a mass uplift, my mountain has an has a uplift rate, which is the same everywhere. It's like a block uplift. Then erosion has to be the same everywhere to compensate for uplift such that we are in a steady state situation. So I can write erosion equals uplift because u minus e equals zero equals k a m s n according to this number one part of the of the of our reasoning here that erosion is proportional to stream power. And so from this, you have a relationship between drainage area, slope of the river, and uplift. You can take out erosion, you know, out of the out of the, the system. And so the slope reflects the ratio between uplift and erodibility. And you can express, you can solve that and, and write S, the slope is equal to U over K with exponents that I can't uh, even see here, but I think it's one over N times A, M over N. Okay. Yes. And so what this tells you is that, um, I mean, this is a constant u over k exponent one over n because n is a constant, k is a constant and uplift is a constant. Okay, but A increases downstream according to Hack's law. When you are here, you have a drainage area A. When you are here, you have a drainage area middle, uh, a bit bigger A, A, bigger A, bigger drainage area. And here you have a much bigger drainage area. So as you go downstream, drainage area increases. And M over N, in general, is lower, smaller than one. Okay. So, um, sorry, it's not smaller than one. Uh, M over N, whatever M over N, I'm not speaking about the ratio M over N, but Um, to keep this equation balanced, when A increases, I need to decrease slope. Okay. Um, think about it here. If you want to, uh, you have uplift is a constant here. K A S. Let's put n equals one, m equals one, n equals one. 
KAS. To keep U equals E equal constant downstream, when I increase A, I need to decrease S. Let's say I double A, I need to, um, I need to uh, half S if I want to keep the same value on that, on that side of the equation. Okay, so as you go downstream those rivers, um, the slope of the river, sorry, decreases. So at equilibrium, your bedrock river has a concave longitudinal profile. And the velocity at which slope decreases, so the rate of, of slope decreases, it's, it's kind of called, it's called sorry, the uh, uh, steepness index. It's written here in very small and very bad. So the steepness index is, uh, is a measure of the steepness and it's, it's the ratio between uplift and erodibility. So if you increase uplift, your river will be um, steeper. Same thing, if your rocks become, for the same uplift, for the same um, erosional uh, power and the same size of a river, let's say a river which is 20 kilometers long and has a drainage area A, if you increase uplift, your equilibrium profile will be steeper, it will go higher up elevation will increase. If you, in, if you um, have uh, more resistant rocks, which means you decrease K, you will also increase the steepness and your river will be more uh, steep. Okay, but always you will have a longitudinal profile, uh, a concave upward longitudinal profile. Okay, um, on the contrary, for an alluvial river profile, there is not much change in drainage area downstream. Sometimes you can even have a long river with no change in drainage area. Okay. And so in this case, um, in this case, you have uh, most, most uh, alluvial rivers, uh, they have uh, quite a linear profile. However, every time there is a junction, like here, you increase suddenly the drainage area above this point, and therefore your slope should also decrease. So, on the long scale, you should also have a longitudinal uh, concave profile. But when you reach um, the basin, often your system becomes distributive and not anymore aggregative. In the mountain and here, your rivers, they join downstream. So as you go downstream a river, you aggregate more and more drainage area. At some point, when you are very uh, in, the, in the downstream plains and your, your river before reaching the, the, the sea and also at the sea in the delta, typically, the river becomes distributive. So it means that the river splits into different branches. So it's the exact contrary of what happens in the upstream area. Is the diagram that we've seen with, uh, uh, that Schum uh, drew here. Um, this 
this one. In the sediment production, we have aggregation of streams. And so at the end, we have a high flux of water and sediment and a big drainage area, whereas each little stream has a small drainage area. Here in the sediment transfer, we have no change in water in drainage area. So the water discharge does not change. And this is supposed to be more of a linear profile. Okay, the slope has no reason to change, no major reason to change, but there are effects like grain size, sediment flux, which can modify the slope. In general, it still decreases a little bit. But here, actually, is the absolute contrary of what happens here. And so a channel like this suddenly splits into two, and each of those segments should actually be steeper than this one because it has less water. Okay. So, so that's um, that's a frame to have in mind when you look at uh, tributary and distributary systems. Okay, I I come back. To, oops, to here. Okay. Now, what I want to uh, speak about, if I come back to the plan that we outlined at the beginning, which is this one, and I should modify it, which I will do now. Um, I want to call this signals. I want to switch this up. Instead of controls, oops. Instead of controls, as I had here, which were tectonics, climate, and autogenic processes, I wrote signals. Okay, so. We are going to look at tectonics, climate, and autogenic signals, which are uh, signals here in the, in the sense that these um, phenomena, these factors, they, uh, tectonics and climate, you can, you can uh, consider them as external forces. Sometimes you will hear the term forcing or allogenic which is the opposite of autogenic, allo like in alloctonus. So they, um, they are external forces acting on the sedimentary system. And so I start with tectonics, and this is not an exhaustive, um, an exhaustive view, uh, I realized while I was uh, finishing the, the PowerPoint. But you, um, you know, the, 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 the first order tectonic uh, frame is set by plate tectonics. And we can have plates which converge, diverge, or slide apart of each other. Okay, so we have convergence, divergence, or uh, sliding apart of each other. And so, um, here I have only put convergence, divergence, and another type of uh, tectonics. Why I didn't put the sliding apart um, uh, configuration it's because in general when when two plates slide past each other uh, if they if it's a pure sliding apart sliding uh, it's, if it's a pure uh, motion of strike slip um, then uh, there's not much happening Okay, the fault separating the, 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 the localized, localized zone of deformation is very steep, maybe even vertical. 
and so there is not much happening in terms of uh, of deformation except except a, a very large offset and very fast uh, tectonic uh, slip rates but as soon as you have little uh, little um, um, uh, asperities, uh, little uh, a bit of roughness along the system. For instance, often you you often you have a, um, along your fault you have a, a, a step. So if this happens, then you create a hole. Okay, I'm looking from you're looking from above, or you create a pressure zone, and so basically you partition your motion into convergent and divergent modes. Okay, so you need to know convergence, divergence, and you need to know that on in a strike slip zone, uh, you may partition your strike slip motion into pure strike slip and convergence, divergence, depending on the configuration. Think about some of those uh, places like the, um, the, the Dead Sea Fault, you know, which goes from the which goes from the, um, the Red Sea all the way into uh, Lebanon, and then and then turns. But uh, at some places you have a, a pull apart basin like the Dead Sea, so that creates a depression and it's and it's a divergence. And in other places you you create a mountain belt like in Lebanon, because you have a a, a bend that. Uh, requires uh, deformation to partition into straight slip and compression. So in a convergent uh, setting, um, so these are these, these arrows, you know this kind of, uh, of settings. Uh, often you have a lower plate and an upper plate. In case you have uh, the lower plate on that side, uh, so, so this is not meant to be um, an accurate uh, drawing, but just to symbolize a few of the processes that take place in this uh, in this compressive environment. Um, when this happens, you generally thicken actually the entire lithosphere, and by thickening the lithosphere, as we have seen uh, previously, first you uh, it's like the iceberg so you have a part that stands out and a root that is uh, in the subsurface below but the lower plate uh, and the plates around actually have a rigidity and they are coupled to some extent so so they also flex uh, under the the way of that uh, iceberg here okay it's not like water, which has no rigidity. Uh, it's really, there is a rigidity here. And therefore you create depressions on both sides of, um, of your thickened uh, zone here. And in blue is the topography. Here is the rock uplift. Uh, I, I, I took this um, drawing from, from the, the Willet paper. Uh, showing the, the, the influence of, of erosion on, on uh, origin. And so this is meant to, to show the uh, motion of particles. Um, and this is a rock uplift and resulting topography. Um, and on that side, we, you have what we call the pro foreland basin. And on that side, on the upper plate, you have the retro foreland basin. Okay. And what I want to uh, highlight here is the kind of scale of what we're speaking about. Okay, and there, there may be sometimes more, sometimes less, but in general, again, uh, it cannot be a couple of kilometers or even 10 kilometers wide because you do not flex the entire lithosphere uh, to make just a small zone. Okay. Uh, in general, we are speaking about that, those kind of, of uh, spatial uh, scales. 
Here on that uh, diagram, what I show is the time evolution of different things, different aspects. Um, first, the subsidence, and I put subsidence, flexural subsidence and overloads, because they are, they are often overloads, because this is considered as a load responsible for the flexion. But very often, people who study this uh, come to the conclusion that the observed load is not sufficient to explain the observed subsidence. So it seems that there is additional forces pushing, uh, pulling down the mountains, okay, and pulling down the plate. Uh, and there is a a variety of, of possibilities. But the general um, pattern of subsidence evolution with time is that of a relatively slow subsidence at the beginning, increasing then uh, quite fast. And then, and then at the end of the evolution of a mountain belt, sometimes or not sometimes, but um, often, convergence stops. This could happen when you have a real suture, but not always. But when the two plates have, have collided so much that you have a, a cicatrice, and that's not that's only that's now one plate. Okay, there is no reason to continue. But sometimes it continues. Uh, but if if it stops like it did in, in many mountain ranges uh, worldwide, um, you continue erosion and you are going to re-equilibrate the uh, thickness of the lithosphere. And therefore you can expect a rebound and erosion. Okay, so this is following a point, you know, here. So for instance, a point which is here at the beginning was here and it's being dragged down it's here. And now if we stop convergence, there's going to be erosion and this point will go up by isostatic rebound. This is what we see. Often we see turbidetic uh, facies in mountain ranges. Here in the Alps, we've seen the Zollhaus uh, Flisch, for instance, with, uh, with you, Betim. Uh, if you go in the Pyrenees, you see, you see turbidites everywhere. They are marine facies. And not only were they uh, below sea level at the time of deposition, but after deposition, they have been buried down several kilometers. Okay, a rock here, which is a turbidite, was deposited here in the basin and is now dragged down and buried deep in the basin. So it's several kilometers down. But when we erode at some point, this is going to go up. Okay. So this is the, 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 the story of, of, uh, of a point in the basement. Sorry, Betim, you just said yes or you wanted a, you had a question? No, I just said yes. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and here I tried, and I'm not totally satisfied, but I tried to show different things. Um, one is rock uplift. And so during the evolution of, of the mountain range, we can imagine that Rock uplift is slow at the beginning and then increases to a maximum and then decreases to zero. Uh, oh, not to zero, but because when you have erosion and no convergence, you still have rock uplift. But so it decreases to some lower and lower and lower value until the mountain range uh, dies. Uh, that makes sense. And topography evolves very similarly except it increases at the beginning, reaches maybe some steady state um, if erosion and uplift manage to compensate each other. And then it decreases, but it decreases really slowly. We see many mountain ranges worldwide um, that still have topography despite convergence has stopped already since, uh, since a while. Okay, so um, so that's why I decrease topography slowly. And in orange, I have sediment flux. 
Okay, so because it's just the difference between both. So I imagine that the long term signal of a mountain range is, is like this is an increase in sediment flux, a maximum, some sort of steady state, and then decreasing. But it doesn't decrease to zero, okay, because you still erode the mountain range. We're still eroding uh, very old mountain ranges. Um, that said, okay, this is not finished. Uh, what I what I should add here is smaller scale, uh, smaller time scale tectonic signals within this diagram. For instance, convergence rate can change, you know, can accelerate uh, suddenly or decelerate. And so this has importance into uh, rock uplift rates uh, within a mountain range. And so this can happen on relatively brief uh, time scales. What does not happen is very dramatic uh, rock uplift variations with time on very small time scales, like tens of thousands. But I mean, it doesn't seem to happen. There is no reason that it happens because the plate engine is is uh, is uh, is quite a, it's like a diesel. If you want, when you start, it has some inertia. Okay, so it doesn't start and go. The plates they don't move, and then uh, the day after, stop moving. They, when they start moving, because they are driven by very big processes, when they start moving, they move, uh, they move, uh, and they don't stop and go. Uh, 